Hello, I'm Pete Bellotta. You won't find many woodworkers who would argue that the table saw is the hardest working tool in their shop. Think about it. This wood shop workhorse can rip, bevel, cross cut and miter, as well as produce a variety of woodworking joints such as rabbits, dados and tenons. Of course, even with all this versatility, there's no such thing as a one size fits all. That's why table saws come in three basic models, including stationary or cabinet saws, contractor or job site saws, and portable or benchtop table saws. In this program, we're going to explore these multi-purpose machines and show you how to get the most out of the type that best suits your needs. A table saw is essentially a circular saw permanently mounted to a base and covered by a flat top. The blade extends above the table through a removable slotted insert called a throat plate. In a benchtop model, as well as some low-cost job site saws, the blade is driven directly by a universal motor. These compact motors are intended for light-duty applications and are so named because they can operate on either AC or DC power. The chief benefit of a universal motor and direct drive system is that it saves space and reduces bulk. This is the key to the tool's portability. However, since these motors rely on brushes to transmit current internally, they tend to be noisy. In addition, the lightweight construction of the tool itself, which is typically a combination of aluminum and plastic, does little to absorb motor vibration. This reduces cutting accuracy and consistency. On stationary saws, as well as some job site saws, the blade is driven by an induction motor along with a belt and pulley system. Unlike universal motors, induction motors are designed for heavy duty use and are relatively quiet due to their brushless design. On most professional grade job site saws, the motor is mounted on the outside of the frame in the rear. On cabinet saws, the motor is housed within the boxy enclosure along with all other working components. As you may have guessed, the cabinet saw is the granddaddy of table saws. The sheer mass of these machines with their huge cast iron tables virtually eliminates vibration. In addition, their large induction motors, typically three to six horsepower, can slice through the thickest stock without burning the material. Although table saws come in different sizes, to accommodate the various needs of woodworkers, they all have the same basic controls. Let's start with the most obvious by looking at the on and off switch. All table saws are equipped with a heavy duty on off switch that is clearly marked on the front of the machine. Most bench top and job site saws use a rocker or paddle type switch, while cabinet saws typically have individual push button switches for the on and off functions. One of the most important considerations when choosing a table saw is its maximum cutting depth at 90 degrees. This is controlled by the height adjustment wheel located on the front of the machine. While most table saws have a 10 inch blade, some cabinet saws are equipped with a blade that is 12 inches in diameter. Of course, maximum cutting depths vary by model with three inches being typical for 10 inch machines. On 12 inch table saws, the maximum cutting depth at 90 degrees is typically four inches. For best cutting efficiency, Adjust the blade so that the bottom of the gullet is even with the top surface of the material. The saw blade gullet is the open area between the teeth. To set the cutting angle, table saws are equipped with a locking tilt control that allows the saw to make bevel cuts up to 45 degrees. Bevel settings are indicated on the scale at the front of the unit. Be aware that the saw's maximum cutting depth at 90 degrees decreases as the cutting angle is increased. Most 10 inch saws will cut material up to two and a half inches thick at 45 degrees. To control the cutting width, every table saw is equipped with a rip fence. The fence is mounted to the right of the blade and moves laterally along a fractional scale. When locked into position, the distance between the rip fence and the saw blade should be the same at both the front and rear. All table saws come with a miter gauge for cross cutting material from 90 to 45 degrees. The gauge moves parallel to the blade along a slot machined into the saw table. Since the gauge is narrow, it can be difficult to support the workpiece, especially when cutting at an angle. For this reason, the gauge has two holes in it so a wooden extension can be attached. 
With an extension attached, the workpiece can be safely supported with both hands or it can be secured with a clamp on one end. Today's table saws are equipped with oversized on-off switches. These switches not only reduce the risk of accidental triggering, but allow the machine to be shut down quickly with virtually anything close at hand, such as a push stick. Other safety features include a metal or plastic guard to shield the user from the rotating blade and flying debris, along with a splitter to minimize kickback and spring-loaded paws. The blade guard is designed to ride on top of the material as it is fed through the saw, while the splitter keeps the saw curve open to eliminate kickback. Under normal conditions, the material only contacts the front half of the blade. Kickback occurs when the wood contacts the back half of the blade. Under this condition, the material can be thrown backwards toward the operator with considerable force. For example, when cutting moisture-laden material, the saw curve may actually close up, pinching the back of the blade in the process. As a result, the spinning blade will propel the material back at the operator, resulting in a potentially serious injury. By keeping the saw curve open, the splitter keeps the material clear of the blade, significantly reducing the chance of kickback. Under normal conditions, the anti-kickback paw allows the wood to move in the forward direction. However, if the material binds, the teeth bite into the wood, preventing it from being hurled toward the operator. While it may be considered by some more of a convenience than a safety feature, most table saws come with a dust collection port. This allows the machine to be connected to a shop vac or central collection system. Reducing flying sawdust not only keeps the air cleaner, it also provides the operator with a better view of the work for improved safety. While the table saw is perhaps the most versatile tool in a woodworking shop, it is arguably the most dangerous. In this section, we'll show you the operating techniques that will ensure your safety. To begin with, make sure the blade is adjusted to the proper height. The higher the blade is above the workpiece, the greater the risk of kickback. Before cutting the workpiece, be sure to remove any staples, nails, or other fasteners, as well as loose knots. When feeding material into the saw, Position yourself to the left of the blade. This will prevent the material from striking you in the event of kickback. Even with the blade guard in place, you want to keep your hands a safe distance from the spinning blade. That's why using a push stick is essential when ripping narrow stock. When ripping a wide board, apply pressure with your right hand directly behind the material but out of line with the blade and use your left hand to hold the board on the table while keeping it against the fence. Feed the workpiece at a steady rate until it is completely past the blade and then turn the machine off. For long workpieces, have an assistant support the material or use an outfeed support stand. Whenever you're using a table saw for cross-cutting narrow pieces of stock, always clamp a spacer block to the fence first. The spacer should be positioned several inches behind the front of the blade. Never use the fence as a stop when cross-cutting narrow stock since the cutoff material will bind between the blade and fence and be thrown back towards you. If you're making multiple crosscuts, be sure to turn the saw off frequently and remove the accumulated pieces. On most saws, the guard and splitter are a single unit, which means that neither device can be used separately. Consequently, making cuts like grooves and rabbits can only be accomplished with the blade guard removed since the splitter would prevent the workpiece from clearing the blade. To avoid an obvious safety hazard, a simple wooden guard made from three-quarter inch material can be used. The two-piece guard consists of a backer board that attaches to the fence and an adjustable guard that shields the blade. Finally, always put on a pair of clean safety glasses along with hearing protection before operating the table saw. Even if you're using an inexpensive benchtop table saw, you can still produce clean and precise cuts provided you're using a high quality blade appropriate for the application. Saw blades are generally classified according to the material used for the blade teeth, which is either steel or carbide. Steel blades, while inexpensive, dull relatively quick 
and ultimately put more stress on the saw's motor. In contrast, carbide blades, which are basically steel blades with carbide teeth attached, cut cleaner and last far longer, effectively justifying their higher cost. And while the teeth on a carbide blade may be ground in various ways, the three most common grinds are the square grind, alternate bevel, and triple chip. On a square ground blade, all of the teeth have a flat top. This grind is designed primarily for ripping. On blades with an alternate top bevel, each pair of teeth is angled in opposite directions. This grind is best for cross-cutting. A blade with a triple chip grind consists of flat top teeth alternately spaced by three-sided teeth. This design is used for making splinter-free cuts in hardwoods and plastics. For the cleanest cross-cuts, blades with 60 or more teeth are the best choice since it's important to have more teeth in contact with the wood. For ripping, however, a blade with fewer teeth should be used. This is because ripping creates more dust and places greater stress on the motor. 24 to 40 teeth on a 10 inch diameter blade is ideal. In order to perform both ripping and cross cutting without spending time changing blades, use a 50 tooth combination blade. Unless you plan on ripping hardwoods like oak or maple, a high quality combination blade may be the only type you'll ever need. When it comes to cutting the wide curves required for joinery, the table saw can be fitted with either a stacked or wobble type dado head. A stacked dado head consists of various thickness chippers sandwiched between a pair of circular saw blades. A wobble type dado head is typically a singular saw blade flanked by a pair of beveled washers. The washers allow the blade to move from side to side as it spins, effectively creating a wide curve. Both dado head styles are adjustable, allowing you to make cuts from 3 16 of an inch up to 13 16 wide. In order to use a dado head on your saw, you'll need a table insert with a wider slot. These inserts can be purchased from the manufacturer or from your woodworking retailer. To ensure that your table saw delivers consistently accurate cuts without kickback, we're going to cover four common maintenance procedures, namely blade alignment, fence alignment, 90 and 45 degree blade stops, and replacing the blade. Warning, always unplug the table saw before performing any maintenance checks or adjustments. To check blade alignment, begin by removing the blade guard. With the blade set at 90 degrees, raise it to the maximum height. Using a felt tip marker, place a mark on a tooth at the front of the blade. Mark a right set tooth on blades with an alternate top bevel. Now, rotate the blade so that the tooth is about a half inch above the table. Next, place a combination square into the right side miter gauge slot. Adjust the ruler so that it contacts the previously marked tooth and then lock the ruler into position. Now, rotate the blade so that the marked tooth is a half inch above the rear of the table and then slide the square to the rear until the ruler aligns with the marked tooth. If the ruler contacts the tooth, as it is here, the blade is properly aligned. Aligning the blade to the miter gauge slot is typically accomplished by fine tuning an adjustment mechanism located underneath the tabletop. On some saws, however, like this model, the blade to table position is fixed and cannot be adjusted. If this is the case with your saw and the blade is not perpendicular to the miter gauge slot, contact the equipment manufacturer. Now, let's check out fence alignment. Begin by positioning the fence a short distance from the miter gauge slot on the right side of the table and lock it into position. Using an engraved ruler for best accuracy, measure the distance between the fence and one edge of the slot at the front and rear. As you can see, this fence is misaligned as indicated by the difference in the front and rear measurements. On most saws, the alignment can be corrected by adjusting the fence's locking mechanism. Once the appropriate screws have been loosened, lift up the handle and hold the fence bracket firmly against the front of the table. Next, move the opposite end of the fence to the right or left as needed. With the fence repositioned, tighten the screws and then lock the handle. Now, recheck the front and rear dimensions. The fence is aligned properly when both measurements are the same. 
To check the 90 and 45 degree blade stops, raise the blade to its maximum height. Next, loosen the bevel lock, set the blade to its maximum vertical position, and then tighten the lock. Place a combination square on the table and slide it against the blade. If the blade is 90 degrees to the table, there should be no gap between the blade and square, and the pointer on the bevel scale should indicate zero degrees. Now, loosen the bevel lock and set the blade to its maximum angle. With the combination square firmly on the table, slide the 45 degree side against the blade. Once again, there should be no gap between the blade and square. At this point, the bevel scale should read 45 degrees. If a gap exists with the blade in either position, adjust the stop screws according to the instructions in the operator's manual. In order to keep the saw curve open and prevent kickback, the splitter must be perfectly aligned with the blade. To check the alignment, place a straight edge against the blade and splitter. If the splitter is misaligned, as it is here, loosen the retaining bolt or bolts and slide the splitter into the correct position. To change the blade on any table saw, begin by removing the table insert and then raise the blade to its maximum height. If the arbor on your saw has two flats, Use the open end wrench that came with the machine to keep the arbor from turning. If there are no flats on the arbor, place a block of wood in front of the blade to keep the arbor from turning. Now, use the box wrench that came with the saw to loosen the blade retaining nut and then remove the nut and washer. Install the replacement blade on the arbor with the teeth facing the front of the saw. Install the washer and hand tighten the retaining nut. Lock the arbor using the appropriate method and then secure the nut with a box end wrench. After lowering the blade, install the table insert. Warning: Serious injury can occur during blade replacement if your hand slips off the wrench or the wrench slips off the retaining nut. To prevent this, always wear a pair of heavy gloves when loosening or tightening the retaining nut. Now I'd like to share several tips with you that will help make those difficult cuts a lot easier and safer. When ripping narrow stock, a push shoe makes it easier to handle the workpiece. To use the shoe, place the heel against the workpiece and ride the fence as you move the material past the spinning blade. If you're planning to cut thin strips of wood on your table saw, you'll typically run into two problems. Number one, the blade guard won't allow you to move the fence close enough to the blade, and two, the strips will be too thin to use a push shoe. To overcome the first problem, I made a simple fence extension out of 3 quarter inch stock. This L-shaped extension is 10 inches wide. Clamp the extension to the fence and then set the fence for the desired ripping width by adding the width of the extension. To handle the second problem, make a push block by gluing a quarter inch strip of hardboard an inch and a half wide to a piece of 3 quarter inch stock 6 inches wide by 8 inches long. To cut the strip, guide the workpiece along the extension and then use the push block to safely feed the back end of the material through the blade. Now here's a tip that will allow you to cut a straight edge on any boat or wavy board. Take a look. Using the appropriate length screws, fasten the crooked board to a piece of 3 quarter inch plywood. The plywood should be at least twice as wide as the material being cut and have a clean edge to ride along the fence. Be sure to position the fasteners in the waist areas of the workpiece a safe distance away from the edge you'll be ripping. With the fence set to the proper width, feed the assembly through the saw to create a straight edge. This tip will help you salvage all that bowed lumber you've been saving. Now, let's review the key